A book dating back to the Ming Dynasty outlines a game in which two players use their hands to represent creatures that either overpower or destroy the other. Japanese history brings us some form of this game by the name Sansukami Kin. This game pitted three creatures against each other, the slug, the frog, and the snake. Today you might know this game as Rock, Paper, Scissors or Rochambeau, named after Count Rochambeau who allegedly played the game during the Revolutionary War. The rules of this game are simple, and the basis behind what every game uses in its internal logic. If I choose rock and you choose paper, then I win. Rock beats paper. Every game from Rochambeau to Red Dead Redemption works this way. If you sell X item, then you get Y dollars. In fact, almost every program ever uses this exact same logic. And you use it every day. If you work overtime, then you get more money, or at least you should. If, then. If you run out of eggs, then you need to get more, but if you have no money, then you get no eggs. This is a perfect example of an if and statement. If eggs equal zero and money equals zero, then no eggs for you. But if eggs equal zero and money equals a thousand, then go crazy, as many eggs as you want. These examples, when extrapolated, can make for the structure of much larger games. Let's say you're making a fantasy open world RPG. Everything from the currency to the combat to the alliance can be held within these statements. If you go to Skyrim and you are in good standing and your health is above zero, then you're free to walk around and have fun. But if you are seen by an enemy and they're within reach, then maybe you've got a fight on your hands. And if your health reaches zero, then you die. But while this may be how games work, it doesn't make it fun. I can write out a really simple code that says if the user enters A, then the computer spits out B, and vice versa, forever into infinity. But it's not very fun. It just is. How do games work out in such a way that they are fun to play? In Ravkofter's book, A Theory of Fun, he says that the fun from games arises from mastery. Getting really, really good at something that you didn't start out great at. Or solving puzzles, feeling like you're learning or accomplishing something. He says that with games, the learning is the drug. Getting good at things feels good, and being bad at them, well, not so great. But that has never stopped us silly humans. Evolutionarily, it makes sense to get good at something, because getting good at something meant surviving, living to see another day. If you eat, then you live. But we don't need games to survive, right? We think about kids these days being so hung up on games and phones, but Slug Frog Snake was being played centuries before the internet. Games help us with mental focus and bonding with one another. A closer bond means a closer tribe, and a closer tribe means we fight for each other. Animals like dolphins and dogs can be seen in the wild playing and practicing and bonding together. They're releasing so many happy chemicals in their brains, so maybe they don't need games to survive, maybe they need them to really live. Ennui is the feeling of having nothing to do, nothing to challenge your brain, it's boredom. And while it's important to be bored sometimes, it can actually be a dangerous thing. For the average Joe, being bored in small amounts isn't very detrimental. But chronic boredom can increase your risk factors for mental health issues. Boredom in patients with things like PTSD or schizophrenia can experience more frequent or intense flare-ups of symptoms like hallucinations. And long-term boredom can increase your risk of things like cardiovascular disease because of all the stress hormones that are released into your body. So games do work within this if-then system, but they also just work for us. And for dogs and dolphins and a lot of other animals. Ludology is the study of games. Not just video games, but board games. Any game you can imagine throughout history or game culture and its role in society. One of the first big societal worries of games in our recent history was violence in video games. Some studies have shown that violent video games like Grand Theft Auto can actually be good for decreasing aggressive tendencies in people, while others have shown the exact opposite. People have been upset with board games like Monopoly for bolstering the idea of capitalism. But they all boil down to a few characteristics. Accomplishment. Winning. Learning. Just like Raph said in A Theory of Fun. But some really are dangerous. Casino games play on that idea that we love winning and will do anything that it takes to have that feeling again. Ludomania. Problem gambling or compulsive gambling takes this idea that we really love winning. We especially love winning zero-sum games. 
Rock, paper, scissors generally consists of one loser and one winner. If I lose, then naturally you must have won. A game of one-on-one -on -one poker can seem like a zero-sum game, but if you win, did you? Because for all of my life, I've always heard one phrase repeated over and over. The house always wins. You may have won this singular zero-sum game, but how much did you lose in total in your whole run? It doesn't matter because we love the feeling of winning, the triumph. And it's likely what got us so far to begin with, because we don't just love winning, we hate losing. Because before Monopoly and slot machines, losing meant dying. It's vastly different, but it feels the same to us. When you play a game, your fight or flight response can be triggered. You get excited about winning or nervous that you're going to lose, just like when you're in a fight, which can also be considered a zero-sum game. They either stay up or you do and it could likely be humanity's oldest game. Maybe like with most things, games should be kept to moderation, or you can always pose this simple logical statement. If games are good for you, then you should play them. But that's all, and as always, okay, bye.